The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. For this year, I know the Lord's really laid it up on my heart to challenge the church and all those connected with us to the love challenge. Um, you know, first we challenge you with the 60-day challenge, and that's really training a whole generation how to deal with emotions because it's been a neglected topic in the church. And if you can't deal with the emotions, um, you can have all the Bible knowledge in the world, and it's not going to really uh, reflect a lot of anointing. Uh, Secondly, we saw that once a person learned how to deal with their emotions effectively, there was the peace challenge. And we, seriously, we did not recommend new Christians to do the peace challenge because you'd be very disappointed at how often you do not walk in peace. When the scripture said, let the peace of God rule. So we even, we even devised a little uh, catchphrase for people that were working on it that uh, your emotions are your friends. Even like Big Bird used to come in on the children's program with a sign. <laughs> we would say, it's just like Big Bird's coming in on the sign saying, when you're angry, fearful, guilty, ashamed, hurt, Big Bird comes in, Jesus isn't ruling right now. <laughs> you know, make them your friends. Your, even your negative emotions can be your friends because they tell you Jesus isn't ruling in your life right now. So sometimes you kind of need that as a little spark. But the peace challenge, on the other hand, was for people who really learned how to deal uh, and connected with God, learning, you know, John 15 talks about abiding, but you know, that, that's not a mental concept, that's a lifestyle. And some people got pretty good at abiding, then they were challenged by the peace challenge. And they knew how to deal with toxic emotions when they dealt with it. They're past the 60-day challenge. They knew how to do that. They could operate that way. But the peace challenge, they began to see, did you make every decision at work today from the place of peace or from the place of anxiety, from the place of control and stress, or from the place of confident expectation of good that I'm doing in the Lord all that is necessary to do in the Lord? And, you know, peace Check yourself out during the day because there are legitimate Christians. By legitimate, I mean they're born again and they live in low-grade anxiety most of the time. That's fear. That's the wrong kingdom. Jesus isn't ruling. Your Bible knowledge apparently isn't really taking if you're that fearful or anxious most of the time. That's the wrong kingdom. The banner over us is love the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And actually, righteousness is love and action. You could say the kingdom of God is love, joy, peace. And so I've been meditating on this, and I'm, I'm, I'm believing for the whole church. To take a look in the Amplified, uh, most of you have read the Beatitudes, uh, Matthew chapter 5. But read it in the Amplified. I know it gets a little lengthy. I had a, I discipled a young Harvard graduate who was doing 10 engineers' jobs. I mean, that's, that's over the top. That's not just a Harvard graduate. That is a brilliance way beyond. And he used to get a kick out of the Amplified. He used to talk to me. He was, we had a carpool together, and he would talk to me in the Amplified. And he would say, well, today we've got to trust in, rely upon, and adhere to the Lord. You know, <laughs> he would talk Amplified. And I'm going, oh, thank God we don't talk like that all the time. But yet... <laughs> But look at trust in the Lord. Yeah, oh, yeah, I trust in the Lord, and then I do what I want to do. But trust, cling to, adhere to, and rely upon with a more implicit trust. Huh? There's a little bit more to it. It's more like duct tape <laughs> than just some kind of mental concept. So um, 
but he got a kick out of that. He used to like talking and amplified Bible until we had to slap him uh, and tell him, stop it, knock it off. <laughs> You're driving us all crazy. But listen to the Amplified in the Beatitudes. I want to start every message with this because this needs to be fortified as a life experience, not just information. Matthew 5, 3, we know it as blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed. Listen to this. Blessed, happy, to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of the outward circumstances. And by the way, in the Beatitudes, every one of them says regardless of outward circumstances. Most Christians call blessed when things are going good and a bummer when things are going bad. This is, a, this is supposed to be a spiritual challenge that you live in apart from. And quite frankly, uh, I think we have some people that are very, very proficient in learning to abide. At least in my leadership, I'm very confident in them. I've seen them come through hell and high water, uh, uh, so to speak, and, and I've seen them really maintain real good. But you know what? We've got to move beyond peace. Peace is still not the power of God that demonstrates to the world. When the pagans were in the arenas watching Christians being fed to the lions, they said those people have a makarios. That's the Greek word for blessed, happy. Happy really is a, just doesn't do it. Makarios. Those people that are being martyred right now have a life joy that's enviable. And they certainly didn't envy their position. They envy, they have something. We have to, as a church, move back into first love. That is the key, and that is the word of the Lord for 2021. Return to first love. And remember, the Ephesian church was rebuked in the book of Revelations. It says, you know, you've done a lot of good things, and that's the mature church, the Ephesians. But it said, I have this against you. You've lost first love. And like we've stated in every message, and I am not having a senior moment, I am repeating it on purpose. Because until I hear it coming out of your lips, I know you haven't heard it yet. And that is that every, every word that comes out of the mouth of God will accomplish the purpose for which it sent, was sent. But I want to hear the kinds of uh, expressions of life joy in the midst of something that's going wrong. That's what's going to witness to the world. They're not attracted even to your peace. Oh, they might be to a degree seeing that oh, I have people come to the church because they watch somebody from our church go through a hard time and keep their peace. That witnesses, but there's something far superior. How about joy in the midst of? I used to find it commendable when people would comment on the joy of a believer who, and as a pastor, a lot of times I have a little more information than the average attendant. I knew what they were going through, and they had more joy than people that weren't going through anything in particular. <laughs> and that was impressive to me. Joy will speak louder. Life joy that is enviable. Do they envy what you have? Do you have a life joy that functions independent of circumstances, or are you still a prisoner to circumstances? Good day, bad day. That's a prisoner of circumstance. But listen to this. Blessed, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous, with a life joy and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward condition, are the poor in spirit. And these are the humble, the ones that consider themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're in the place of lordship. They're ruling in the place of heaven. In the heavenly realm, they are ruling. And that is the witness that the world needs to see. And we're going to see a remnant that is going to be a light that shines in the midst of darkness. But the attractive feature is going to be joy, not just peace. So I want to challenge everybody in the church. You say, well, I know how to deal with my emotions. I know how to deal with the... Because emotions rob you of that intimacy with God. It comes between what you and God should have together, relationally. 
And if you can't get that done, start over and go do the 60-day challenge and don't be proud and say, you know. But if you can't deal with the emotions, you're not going to make much success as far as real kingdom living. The kingdom of God is within you and the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. And righteousness is love in action. So the kingdom, of, to, to be aware of whether or not you're walking in kingdom reality. And again, blessed, happy, with a happiness that's produced by the experience of God's favor. Most people know favor is God's unmerited favor, something that, he, that was given, but especially conditioned by the revelation of His matchless grace. Grace, the personal presence of Jesus, empowering you to be and empowering you to do all that He called you to be and all that He called you to do. Say that word back to me, empowerment. Because John Bevere did a little test, and throughout the United States, all Christians across the board, asked them for a definition of grace. 98 point some percent only knew grace is, I was saved by grace through faith. It was a gift. If that's the only part you know, that'll get you saved. But it's not about the gift of God's grace. It's about the empowerment to live the life. As you received Him, so walk. Isn't it sad? that so many, such a high percentage, could not give a definition of grace as empowerment or the ability to not sin or the ability to do what God called you to do and to be what He called you to be. They, it was that shallow across the board, not in this church because you've heard it enough times. I repeat it more regularly. Grace is the empowerment of God. Grace is available to each and every person. Now, we'll get into that a little bit later, but I just, even, even the scriptures that we've worn out, I doubt if you can go anywhere in the body and ask a Christian, uh, have you ever heard of seek first the kingdom of God? Matthew 6, 33. Have you ever heard of that? And they'll go, oh, sure, seek first the kingdom of God. But in the message translation, oh, it says, steep yourself in God reality. Mm. I pictured that tea bag. Like God was the tea bag and I'm the water. And I'm going to stay, I'm going to draw on the very essence of that tea nature, that God nature. I'm going to steep in God reality. And then the part that needs to be understood is grace is God's initiative. All right? And if I steep in it, it's a steep in God's reality and God's initiative. Well, how do you do God's initiative? I see so many people burned out doing good stuff. How many Christians do you know that quit being a Christian because they tried and they got tired? And there's many right now dropping out. Mostly for fear of what about me? Poor me. But in reality if they would have steeped into the presence of God and drew on Him, God initiative would triumph over self-initiative. Willful people. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, I get around to getting to it. Uh, that is really the message. Feasting on the will of God. And, and this goes way back to after I had pastored about 10 years or more. I was in prayer one time and said, what would you do if you had to do it over again? That's a good question for you to ask as a, as a Christian. What would you study? What would you do if you had to do over again? Knowing what you know now, but going back and saying, if I started over, what would you do different? I think that's a good allowing the Holy Spirit for a little self-examination. And what he told me to do, and basically we have a book on it too, uh, flowing in the river of God's will. He told me to teach on the will because I saw that the will was the most misunderstood or one of the most misunderstood areas. They didn't know where it was and they didn't know how to yield and surrender it. <laughs> they only knew try harder, even in Christianity, try harder and that led to exhaustion, disappointment, frustration, stress, 
It was the opposite of trust because you cannot try and trust at the same time. Trust, if you look at the trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, acknowledge Him in all your ways. That word acknowledge has to do with awareness of His divine presence within you. Acknowledge has nothing to do with this. As a matter of fact, it says, lean not on your understanding, but acknowledge Him. That means through divine, intimate connection. Well, if you don't steep like a tea bag in, the reali in His reality and His initiative, that's just going to be words, words, words. And it's not going to have any life-changing reality. I thought the most perceptive man that ever understood what we teach primarily was that, that African bishop down in Mississippi or Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, I think it was we were. And he says, Dennis and Jennifer are teaching you how, and not a method. Method is for intellectual people trying to pattern it out, ABC. And to some degree, we need that. A, ask Jesus in your heart. B, believe that you received him. And C, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. I could see the value of certain outlines. But in reality, you needed a real encounter. Or it didn't mean anything. It was just words, right? Well, he said, Dennis and Jennifer are teaching how to move from your initial encounter to the subsequent relationship that produces and demystifies a walk in the Spirit. And we sum it up with, as you received him, so walk, Colossians 2.6. Now, if God is speaking for 2021 and Makarios, a return to first love, a first love challenge, and like we said, anybody can say, I, I love God. They have a backslidden Christian. Can, well, if you ask them, do you love God? They'll say, yes, I do. But are you in love with him? And that's what Jesus was saying to that Ephesian church. It's not like they didn't know better. It was a question of, I have this against you. You've lost your first love. You're kind of going through the motions, but your passion is missing. Um, if all of a sudden you find yourself spending more and more time in prayer and more and more awareness that you've got victory during the day, then you're probably on the right track. Now, when uh, feasting on the will of God, I think we've got to talk about that a little bit. We use uh, little sayings and repeat them uh, so all through the modules, if you've taken the modules, and everybody watching... Uh, even, the, even the questions we get asked by emails by people that only, have only seen us on YouTube. Well, quite frankly, most of the, the, uh, some of the best teachings are on the online school and they're taken off of YouTube. <laughs> uh, some of the best sets of truth. If you really want to learn, take the modules. There's one through five really now, not to mention the uh, sexual issues module. But we laid it out from an encounter to the subsequent relationship. And uh, even though I know people appreciated what they've, what they've learned from us online, that's still, that's still kind of like looking at a Christmas tree with all the different ornaments and, oh, this one's good, oh, this one's pretty, this one's good, this one's good. But putting it from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship, I really feel like God's saying for 2021, I'm encouraging people that are connected to us that are not necessarily in this room, uh, but those that are connected with us, get to the online school. Learn it in a sequential order, line upon line, precept upon precept, and it's going to be much better than this uh, hit and miss, pull this out of that and pull this out of It's like... Jennifer and I both have this passion for total concept. Even when I worked in the factory, it was an assembly line of three major plants. They built uh, railroad uh, tank cars. You see those hot dog shaped tank cars on the railroad. Well, I worked in a place where all three plants we were within a mile of each other and worked together I did my job, which was a part of, I had a giant can opener, is what it looked like, and it used to cut half circles that would then get dished, and then they'd get welded together, and they were the ends of the hot dog shape on the cars. 
but I was never satisfied, and Jennifer's cut out of the same, I was never satisfied. I, w I purposely took jobs in all three plants so I could get total concept. I wanted to see how it went from the beginning and how it ended up all the way to the paint shop where they put the numbers on it at the last, at the end. Total concept. And I know Jennifer's, uh, much of her transformation as a Christian came about God opening up the big picture, total concept. So you can't just get this tunnel vision of these little things. You need to know that these things fit together. And I'm not going to do the modules over again. Why would I do the modules over again? Or why would I do it on a Sunday morning if it's been strategically laid out for you hours and hours and hours? Because some people say, how come you don't go to the other building and tape some more modules? Because they're done. Why not learn that? And then even what you get on a Sunday will give application of where it fits. Get the total concept, right? That bishop was quite accurate. From the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship, how to demystify a walk in the Spirit, and we're still doing that. And we're doing it for 2021 to make ready a people prepared to learn to live in the kingdom regardless of outward circumstances. So that's the challenge. That's the love challenge. And that your joy, it should get, I want to hear some testimonies of people who had joy in a difficult situation and the people would actually think of one, one of two things. Wow, I want what they have or they clearly do not know what's going on. These people are oblivious. All right. But either way, it's a compliment, isn't it? Why is that person so happy? They must not be aware of what's going on. You know, they just fired everybody in the office, and this person is, is smiling and in love with Jesus. Okay, they either are clueless, or they've got something that I don't have. And that's what's caused the early church to spread. Now, all right, now we're going to start the message. All right? <laughs> I want to start with a story. The woman at the well. Uh, during the ministry of Jesus, uh, the disciples had a pretty much a temporal focus. As a matter of fact, I find it amazing and wondered, do Christians still do that? No matter what Jesus said, they took it and solidified it in the natural. No matter what he said spiritual, they made it natural. I don't care if it's like, who touched me? Jesus saying, for I perceive virtue flow from me. And they're going, who touched them? I don't know. Everybody's touched. Everybody's crammed. That always, they always do that. I have food that you know not of. Where did he get food? We went to the market and got food. Where did he get the food from? You know? <laughs> and then walking in kingdom, he insulted people left and right. All the religious people. And I used to love it. You know, everything from out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. Because what they were yelling at Jesus that these people were saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Whoa. But he would insult them by allowing them to finish the scripture. Have you not read that out of the mouths of babes? And then Jesus stopped. Pharisees could finish the scripture to still the mouth of the enemy and the avenger. Oh, he's talking about us. <laughs> and he, uh, uh, look at, did you know that in their day, if you were crippled, you were considered not in the image of God. You weren't even allowed to go into the temple. Hmm? And what would Jesus do? He'd say, bring the lame and the crippled into your house. And heal the crippled man on the steps of the temple so that he could go in. He wasn't even allowed in. I love that kind of confrontation, but without the love of God and without the kingdom of God being first place in your life, you will only hear about those things and not be able to demonstrate those things. God's looking for people to demonstrate the kingdom, not talk the kingdom. And then, until this gospel is preached throughout all the world, then the end will come. I heard that my whole Christian life. But they're making it sound like when, the, when we give lip service to this message of the kingdom, then the end will come. No, when this message of the kingdom is demonstrated, that means you have to live it. It has to be visible to where someone wants it. And right now, 
I, uh, I told Jennifer uh, when we first got married, I said, by the way, I said, we're gonna, I'm going to disciple you this in, in spiritual truths and things that I've learned, and we're going to grow together and all of that. I said, but keep in mind, there's nothing meaner on the face of the earth than an angry religious person. I was treated better by unsaved heathens. I had unsaved heathens that when they knew I was a pastor uh, many years ago, <laughs> they swore, they... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they, were almost, they were more respectful than an angry religious person. You give me an angry religious person, and I'll show you. There's the devil. We went to Russia. We saw drunks getting sober in the park instantly, laying the bottle down and sobering up. And we saw soldiers coming and gathering around us while they were doing mime and some activities on the street. People healed in the parks. People wanting prayer, tears flowing out of their eyes. And then the Russian religious people came in full battle array, you know, those black things that they wear with the little funny hats. And they came in. And I didn't have to understand Russian. All I had to do <laughs> is look at their countenance. And I'm going, this must have been what Jesus went through with snarling faces. <laughs> and I was sitting there thinking, they look more demonic than any, any unsaved person in the crowd. Those alcoholics didn't look as demonic. They got free. Isn't it interesting? But God is saying, we as a church are going to hear the word and invite it to become a reality of spiritual food. And, and I've said this again and again. To feed as opposed to just read, to drink as opposed to just think. We don't throw away thinking and we don't throw away reading, but there needs to be a deeper understanding of being fed so that we're not like Jesus' disciple. Where did he get food? I don't know. He said his food's due to the will of God. Well, I don't know what the heck he's talking about. We went down and got food. We had to walk all the way down. He sat up here at the well. <laughs> And then a good Italian mother would try to force feed him something. Eat, eat, you're a little too thin. <laughs> uh, never go to an Italian's house for dinner and not eat everything. You, you will regret it. And it doesn't matter if you're overweight. From their point of view, you're still too thin. <laughs> eat. <laughs> now, during the ministry of Jesus, the disciples had that temporal focus, and they're often concerned about their own physical needs, and I understand that. Isn't that why I seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you? He knows what you need. You get focused on that, you miss the kingdom. And Jesus had an entirely different priority when he said, seek first the kingdom, and he told that Father God will supply everything you need, the whole earth walk of his demonstrated, 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 demonstrated it. He didn't just say the right words. He demonstrated by the words that he spoke, by the life that he lived, and even the death that he died, regardless of circumstances. That's demonstration. When God took me through, and, uh, and I'm not going there, you can go on to school and get it. <laughs> but the last step of a deeper walk with God was demonstration. If you can't live it out, what good is it? Well, how do I live it out? How do I make that word become flesh? Well, look at, look at the way he instructed this, this woman here. Talk about divine appointments and effort. Feasting on the will of God. Say that back to me. Feasting on the will of God. How do you do that? Well, let's look. The woman at the well, John 4, Jesus did a very unusual thing. Instead of going around Samaria, he took the short route. He even said, I must go through Samaria. What he was cutting through again, prejudice. Jews looked down upon the Samaritans. They had intermarried and weren't considered truly Jewish. And instead, Jesus going, I'm going to attack the prejudice. I'm going to go right through there because that's the will of the Father. Now look at it was a long way from Jerusalem to Samaria, like 35 miles, but it was even longer to go all the way around. But a woman there had a divine appointment with Jesus waiting for her. Not only was a Samaritan, but she was a woman and a woman of questionable repute at that. Remember, they wouldn't 
have anything to do with anything. They had the strange concept that any kind of deformity, you know, they should just leave a deformed baby and leave it out to die. Hmm? They just throw it on the, on the dump because it wasn't the image of God, like their heart was. You know? But they're looking at outward appearance. Not only did they not speak with them to Samaritans, but men weren't supposed to talk to a woman unless her husband was present. And rabbis certainly didn't converse with shady ladies like this. All right? So, I mean, he is really messing with your rules and your traditions, isn't he? And yet, it's to deliver the kingdom in a way that your carnal mind is busy arguing. That's where mean Christians come from. Their carnal minds are arguing with things that are going on, failing to see what is God doing. Jennifer's going to get that book out someday, One Nation Under God. And it's, it showed that everything throughout history, it was like a tale of two kingdoms, that a tale of two cities even. It was like up here was light and what God was doing in the midst of what the devil was doing historically. We are better at knowing what the devil's doing historically than we are knowing what does God require at this point in time, regardless of circumstances. What does God require regardless of circumstances? He requires a life joy and a kingdom attitude and a kingdom heart. We need a kingdom challenge. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that this is what is necessary. Luke 117 was our, one of our, our life callings was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers and the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared. Prepared for what? For kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And it can't be lip service. It's got to change. And it can't be carnal interpretations of everything you hear. Uh, I like the understanding there's a dimension there that you need to inquire of. Because your reasoning mind will get you all messed up sometimes. But John 4, verses 3. Uh, let's see how far we go. But he left Judah and departed again to Galilee. This is John chapter 4, starting in verse 3. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore being wearied from his journey. I love that part, that that's in there. In other words, he was God and he was flesh. He was actually weary from the journey, what? Physically. It doesn't say he was having an emotional meltdown. Yeah, 30, you walk 35 miles. You'd be a little weary too, I don't care what kind of shape you're in. All right, he was not. I quit. I, this is too hard. And uh, where, where, why isn't God helping me? I'm weary. That's why you go to sleep. That's why you eat and sleep to rest for your weary body. <laughs> but anyway, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. He said, "Give me a drink." For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, which is totally rational. They went to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you being a Jew are even talking to me? Because I'm going to break through prejudice here and bring some of the kingdom message out of me. No, he didn't say that. He just said, How are you being a Jew? Ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So she's giving them a lecture of religion. And then I said, you preach to Jesus. Okay. So the Samaritan lady's preaching to Jesus, and she's telling them, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that says, give me a drink, you would have asked of him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, you don't, even, you don't have, where's your bucket? Isn't that... That's Christianity too. Hmm? God says, I want you to drink deeply of my presence. And you go, or, or, I don't have a bucket. Where's the bucket? And we don't do it that way in our church. 
You, you do it your way and we do it our way and never the twain will meet. And Jesus said, he answered her and said, whoever drinks the water, this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Uh, this water that I give him will become in him, in him, a fountain living up. I can just see his disciples go. A fountain in him and you never thirst again. He's weary from the trip. He's walked a long ways, tired. Maybe a little bit too much sun. I don't know. Huh? But if you drink this water, you will never thirst again. It will be in you a fountain springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I might never thirst again. I'm tired of walking up this hill, getting water. You can still be thinking of your own selfish, carnal nature, can't you? Jesus said, oh, now he's messing. <laughs> Didn't you know it? He has to mess a little bit. After all, he had to go through Samaria for this purpose. He only does what he sees the Father doing. He only says what he hears the Father say. Go call your husband. The woman answered, I, she's going to give a half truth. All right, yeah, you know, half truth, then you just move on. I have no husband. She said, mm, that's right, and the one you have right now is not your own. You've had five. <laughs> I perceive you're a prophet. <laughs> Duh, really? You perceive he was a prophet? Okay. <clears throat> And that she wants to talk religion. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place. Isn't that the first thing you do if you get somebody messes and reads your mail? Get into a religious discussion. That was always my gripe against house groups. I saw hurting people that never got the kind of ministry they could get because they hid behind talk. You can hide behind the Bible. Remember that, uh, that Facebook thing? Of course, we did our booklet right after that, small groups that go deep, but they had one. How to have a shallow group. Someone would say, well, what about in the Bible? Oh, we're not going to talk about that kind of stuff in the Bible. We don't want no discord here. We, we want to stay shallow. Well, you know, I had a rough week this week. Oh, I don't want to. Hear, I don't want to hear about it. Uh, no, 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 no. None of that stuff here. We're going to stay light and lively here. Don't be talking about your hard, difficult thing that you had to pray through this week. We don't want to hear it. Okay. Small groups that go shallow. <clears throat> now, you say you worship here. We say and God says, "I want to cut it down to a kingdom message, and it's going to be spiritual." The day is coming and now is when they that worship are going to worship. It's not here or there. It's in spirit and in reality. Truth is reality. In spirit and reality. What did she say then? Okay, I'm not going to argue with this guy. Um, I know that when Messiah comes, well, that's who's speaking to you right now. Uh, went, to the, went to the city. I just met a man. I think he's a prophet. He told me everything about me. He read my mail. Now, the well-trained woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come, see the man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. Because the woman, the harvest came because of the woman. Be become a because. I always love that verse of Scripture that many believed on Jesus because of Lazarus. And the Lord spoke that to me the first time I heard that. When Lazarus was raised, it said many believed in Jesus because of... God says, why don't you, Dennis, become a because? Become a because that many people will believe because of you. Because of the resurrection life in you, many will believe. 
And <clears throat> this woman became the great evangelist, really. The harvest came. Wow. And interestingly enough, the disciples returned with food. <laughs> Oh, don't you love it? Oh, God's trying to say, I'm feasting on the will of God. I'm going to teach you how to feast on the will of God. And those well-discipled disciples, Rabbi, eat. We returned with food. Jesus replied, I have food to eat that you do not know of. Where did he get food? Did he have something packed away in his knapsack that we weren't aware of? I have food that you know. They can't go spirit. They go around. I want to, how do I do this? I repent of getting stuck in that realm of rational intellect. Logic is a good thing when used properly. When it's submitted to the spirit of God, then logic works. And actually, Jesus is quite logical. But if you get locked in, you, you do the opposite of the scripture, John 7, 17, where it says, if you will do my will, you shall know. You give me the average Christian, and they insist on knowing before they will do. How about just being willing to do, and then you'll know what God wants you to do. There's a, there's a submission in there to his lordship that is a prerequisite to walking in the, in, the, in, the, in the word of spirit and truth. Now, <laughs> the disciples were perplexed with that statement. Surely he couldn't have already bought food somewhere. And Jesus further explained, <clears throat> My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. John 4, 34. So Jesus was no longer hungry. Do you believe that he was telling the truth? You think he was playing fake in it? That would be a terrible approach to our Lord, right? So what did he do that he no longer hungered? Apparently, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. He's saying... I, he was weary, that's why he sat down, right? Physically. He got re-strengthened and sustained somehow from doing the will of God. In expressing the kingdom of God and meeting the needs of people, it fed him in such a way that he was satisfied. And he didn't work harder. That's kingdom. God will take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Most people get worn out trying. He was refreshed by doing the will of God from the heart. He was sustained, strengthened. Jesus did the work of the Father. God's kingdom became nourishment or supernatural nourishment or supernatural food. He had feasted at the royal banqueting table. And really, I want a light bulb to go on to every kingdom life person, every full stature uh, person that's in partnership with us. And I want you to reread your Bible on food and feasting. Do you have any idea how, how much Jesus talked about that? And to think in terms of a sit-down dinner only will prove you're shallow. <laughs> So stop being shallow. Look at your Bible, how many times he's talking. He is not talking about natural. When he says, if any man hears my voice and open the door, I will, he will come into me and I will sup with him. Doesn't mean you're going to sit down and have macaroni and cheese. He's looking for an intimate spiritual relationship. Get out of that logical reasoning head and making everything so shallow. Otherwise, we're going to be just like his disciples. <clears throat> One of the, when, when I was looking at this many years ago, uh, a verse of scripture became so real 
that it was written on the tablet of my heart. It's Jeremiah 15, 16. And it was, your word was found, and I did eat. And it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. That's what God wants to multiply. In other words, your word was found, and I did eat. Jeremiah was not just talking poetically here. He was talking, he found by steeping in the reality of God, some God initiative and God purpose and provision. And that as he did it, it was nourishment. It was sustaining power. It was life with a capital L. It was a life joy that was in me. Your word was found and I did eat. And it was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. The joy and the rejoicing of my heart. The joy and the rejoicing of my heart. You have not fed on the word until it's become the joy. and the. You, you can learn it. You can memorize it. All of those are wonderful things. Read, but that ain't feed. Feasting on the will of God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the course. Your word was found and I did eat. Not only knowing the will of God, but doing it. But when you're doing the, the will of God, you're doing it out of grace that is empowerment. So you don't get tired doing the will of God. You actually accomplish more with less effort. Wouldn't you like to do that on your job? You can walk in kingdom authority on your job it, regardless of circumstances. Who's agreeing with you? Who's working against you? Who's, and have a life joy that's enviable. That's the challenge for 2021. But you better learn how to do the 60-day challenge and deal with your emotions or this is all pie in the sky. You'll say this is impossible. And in that condition, if you don't deal with your negative emotions, yeah, it is. Then once you've gotten a little taste of victory, go to the peace challenge. And ultimately, check yourself out and see. Let the peace of God rule means what? He's in authority at this point in time, regardless of what's going on. Instead of low-grade anxiety and fear. Wrong kingdom. But that's not going to win people. Life joy is what's going to win and demonstrate the kingdom. A makarios. A life joy that is enviable regardless of circumstances. That's what we're going to see in the church. It might be a remnant, but it's going to shine as a bright light in the midst of the darkness all around us. I want everybody to be part of a remnant. It doesn't take a lot. It just takes people to say, I'm going after first love. I don't know if I'm doing real well right now, but I'm just going to surrender more. What have you got to lose? God's going to say, no, 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 don't surrender more. No, no. No, you better eat. You look a little pale. All right? No. Here, here's another wake-up call. God gave me over the years many revelations on the will. And I, and, and I said that still. We've got to feast on his will. Otherwise, we're just going to burn out with religion. And by the way, when you burn out and you get tired, you usually get angry and cranky. And there's nothing more evil than an angry religious person. Give me an unsaved heathen any day over an angry religious person. Look on Facebook. Do you see how many angry people there are? Ugh, it's horrible. They should be ashamed. They think they're doing God a service, but so did the Pharisees. The wrath of man never works righteousness, so tell me about it. So tell me what you're really accomplishing in your hostility and your anger. If the wrath of man never works righteousness, you don't plan on working righteousness, then is that it? You just want to be right. Pharisees were so right, they were wrong. <laughs> now, here's the, here's the truth that sank in at an early Early, early time on searching out the matter of the will of God and feasting on the will of God. It's found in Ezekiel 36, verse 27. It's talking about the day that we're living in now. In the days to come, 
it says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Well, isn't that interesting? I'm going to put my spirit in you. I'm going to give you a new heart and a new spirit, but I'm going to cause you to walk. So who's the initiator there? I will cause you to walk. Who's initiating? It's not about you trying to live the Christian life. That's a waste of time. It's about surrendering to the grace or the empowerment of God who will cause you to... He's the cause. That's how you become a because. <laughs> you can't become a because until He's the cause. And it is God who is at work both to will and to do. Without surrendering and just getting in your head, you're just wasting a lot of time in your Christian walk. Because God's saying, this is the challenge for this year. We're going to get you back to first love. And you're going to fall so in love with Him that it's going to be all about Him. And that it's going to be total immersion. It's like going to a foreign country to learn a new language. You, you, the best way to learn it, right, Jennifer? <laughs> That's the way you learn French. Just totally immersed. Only she did it in America. She'd go to Jacksonville and they'd go shopping to learn different terminology for different stations in life. And they would speak French all day. And she said she was shocked at how many, how many English-speaking people go, why don't those dang foreigners learn English? <laughs> She does, she knows English too, but she was practicing. You need to have, oh, I can remember my first pastorate. People coming to church, unsaved people coming to church because their families were saved and getting saved and delivering a remarkable countenance to them. One man came because he said, my wife and daughter are coming. And it's the church of the what's happening now. That was his unsaved approach. A cop came, his family was saved, and living in real victory, and actually showing a lot of love to him, and he was kind of mean. And he said, I listen to this guy, this Clark guy. He's either the best con artist I've ever run into, or he really believes what he's saying. <laughs> and then there are those that, that came because they said, you know, these people are happy. I don't understand it. Why? You know, because most people's happiness is based on what happens to me and what I get. That's happy. That's not biblical makarios. That is not a life joy that's supernatural. So, I will cause you to walk in my statutes. When you feast on the will of God, you're looking for, remember, seek first the kingdom. And what were the three aspects of seeking first the kingdom? Steeping in God reality, God initiative. There's the God initiative. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. The God initiative comes out of the relationship, out of feasting and feeding upon Him. Read your Bibles all over and underline food, dinner, banquet, or whatever, right? I think he's trying to get something across to us, and it's not about filling your stomach. <laughs> that grace, it's like if I yield the lower life, I gain the higher life. That's what's actually taking place in the spirit realm. If I yield the lower life, my control my trying harder to live the Christian life, if I would yield that over and say, here I am, God, I would be able to receive of the God initiative and the grace. And Jesus wasn't tired. He actually said it was refreshing and sustaining. My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and I've got food that you know not of. And yes, my physical body was weary, but now I've been refreshed and sustained. Most of us have been taught that grace is just that unmerited favor. And I don't want anybody in kingdom life, that's the only definition you know. Because grace is power. Grace is God's divine ability working in us. The simple even definition is grace is the power to not sin. <laughs> I mean, come on. Think of something in the term of empowerment instead of just something free that I got. 
something I got without anything on my part, I, like a gift, I just received it. That's unmerited favor. That's actually quite shallow, even though it's valid. All right, the next thing. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of rush through some of this a little bit. But the yielding is something that has to be taught. To get the higher life, you yield to the lower life. When God was teaching me this in prayer, and it's in simple prayer, and I bet you a lot of people just gloss right over it. In simple prayer, it says, it's a yielding to His will, not my will, his thoughts, not my thoughts, his emotions, not my emotions. But then the scripture that actually did it was, like a weaned child with its mother, I have quieted my soul within me. You didn't pray. You didn't meet God on any day, reading your little daily bread or whatever, your little devotional. You did not meet God until you have quieted your noisy thoughts, your rambunctious will, and your emotions that are still vibrating. You did not meet him until you have quieted your soul, mind, will, and emotions, like a weaned child with its mother, until you feel, because then all of a sudden it takes over. And you're no longer in control, but his presence increases. And it's tangible. And you steep in it, it gets stronger. Remember when I was teaching Jennifer, I said, there, I could by discernment say, she hit the peace of God at a real nice level in prayer. I said, now go deeper. And she goes, how do you do that? And I said, you feel his peace, you feel his presence, let the bottom fall out. <laughs> Just open up the bottom and, to, uh, and let God take you deeper. And peace increases proportional to your yielding. If it is God who it wants to cause you to walk in his statutes, it, the prerequisite is to yield. Yielding requires letting go until you hit the grace of God. The grace of yielding is that you have this capacity to yield and the greater takes over from the lesser. People watching by Ustream, if this stuff is too complicated, it doesn't make sense, Go to the online school and take the modules one, two, in that order, please. Occasionally there's some of these modules one through five, and they're sequentially laid out so that you can add a, like, kind of like uh, geometry used to be. You need to learn the basics before you add the complicated stuff. And people go, I think I'm, I'm pretty mature. I'm just going to skip the module four. That's the kind of reasoning we have. No, you want it from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship, you need to go one, two, three. They're numbered that way on purpose. It was an intent. <laughs> All right? So internalizing, making that connection, you touch. You become a partaker of that divine nature. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, We're his workmanship. We were created before we were even formed in our mother's womb. God had a plan for us. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a lot of this on understanding our food, understanding hungering and thirsting. Oh, my goodness. Blessed, full of life joy are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. How do you hunger and thirst after righteousness if you don't even know how to do it? Say it a lot. I'm going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I'm going to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I decree and declare I hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now how about do it? To hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hunger and thirst. It's not talking about going to dinner. It's not talking about fellowship lunches. It's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. It's hungering and thirsting for the kingdom of Love, joy, peace. No love, joy, peace. You haven't had your hunger or your thirst satisfied. And you certainly haven't found food that Jesus is talking about to do the will of him who sent you. Now here's a, 
here's, a, here's a, a quick summary, and we're going to close with this. I think, I think you're challenged. <laughs> God loves you, and He loves a good challenge. And He loves to challenge us with something that we can't figure out. Doesn't that make you mad? <laughs> Think that he would do something in a way that I can't figure out. Well, I'm not doing nothing until I figure it out. Good luck. I've seen those shipwrecks my entire Christian life. There's some people who never get saved because they're still figuring it out. Even with the ABC. A, ask Jesus to come in. B, believe in your heart. C, confess. I don't think I got that ask part. I don't know about that. Believe. Why can't, why can't he? What about, what about all the evil that's in this world? And how come a loving God? And you know, let's get into some arguments here. Let's get talk. How many angels could fit on the head of a pin? Um, deep truth. Let's let's have a small group where we talk about deep truth. Forget life experience. Let's keep it shallow and talk about deep truth. All right, But here's the way it works. And I want you to pay close attention to this. There's five steps in and five steps out. Are you with me? Okay. You're going to go, oh, no, five steps in. He's going to be here all day. Okay. I'm going to go fast. First of all, the way the Word is made flesh is, first of all, you have to decide, make a choice that I'm going to pursue God. And that's both an inward discipline as well as an outward discipline of sit down and open your Bible. <laughs> then the inward discipline. Now here's the process, and this is the way I taught Jennifer. Uh, she used different words over the years. But I said the first thing you do when you read, you feed. You want to meet the author of that word. You want the reality of that word. Jesus is the word. I don't want just the information. Start with information, but I want that information to be the unfolding of my God. He is the word, and the word wants to be made flesh in me. It was made flesh in him. It's made, it needs to be made flesh in me. I want to feed. So absorb, internalize, use whatever word you want, cherish. Um, and what happens when you do that? First, you make a choice. Secondly, you absorb. Third, it's birthing an attitude. It's birthing something. When you take that word to heart and you internalize it, it's trying to birth something, which means something has to die, <laughs> like your flesh. So while your flesh is dying, God is birthing the reality. And what happens next? After He births it in you, You've become a partaker of the divine nature. It's actually written on the tablet of your heart, received with meekness the engrafted word that is not poetry, that was meant to be an encounter. Not information, an encounter. Written on the tablet of my heart. You became a partaker of the divine nature. Well, you know what happens then? It moves from being a partaker or character development to my value system now is not just ink on a page. My value system is Him, the reality of the living Word. That's my value system. Now, that's how it comes in. Now, how does it go out? And you need to pay attention to this because we, uh, we were talking with Jason and others, and God is clearly speaking something that you can run a test on, and that is the outworking of it. If you are living out of your value system, meaning Jesus Himself, and that word is so real to you that it's expressing itself through you. You're a partaker of the, you're trusting in that word. A word that is written on the tablet of your heart, even ever so mildly, is easier to obey. Remember, I will cause you to walk in my statue. It will be easier to obey than to not obey. You won't struggle with that word. You won't argue with that word. It will be automatic because he will cause you to walk in it. His initiative is there in it because it's written on the tablet of your heart. All right? So now you've got this new value system. And what we teach over and over again is phase two. Pray in the Spirit is one thing because when you pray in the Spirit, it keeps you in the love of God. 
especially when goofy stuff is going on. Cars pulling in front of you, people acting like idiots, and you go, oh, <laughs> it builds you up. It builds your faith. It builds you up, but it keeps you in the love of God. It keeps you dropped down, so to speak. Okay. Now, also, the other avenue to maintain the connection, you must, and this is in the modules. If you haven't taken the modules, you may, you may not, this may not be a, a very practical part of your life, but in this church, it's, for the most part, I know in my leaders, it's a practical, everyday occurrence of their life to walk a forgiveness lifestyle. Say that back to me. To walk a forgiveness lifestyle. That means prompt obedience. That's not holding grudges, I'll deal with it tomorrow. I'm not ready to today. All that's showing you is your obstinate flesh and carnality that has been yet to be impacted. You need to go eat. Feast on the will of God. Because it smells like stinketh fleshish. <laughs> Something's burning in your kitchen and it's not very well smelling. All right? So if you can maintain by praying in the Spirit and walking a forgiveness lifestyle, and I mean spontaneously a forgiveness lifestyle, here's the third element on the outworking. Now you've got God's character development. You're learning to walk in it and stay connected, either by praying in the Spirit or forgiving, whatever gets you back connected. And in that connection, you will see this. This is what we're looking for. An attitude of gratitude. If you had a scripture birthed in you, the proof that it was birthed in you or that it's real is that you maintain that connection and you have an attitude of gratitude. If you're grateful for the things that are this life has given you in Jesus, you are focused more on kingdom than circumstances because if you went by circumstances alone and people and circumstances, which is all of life, you'd say, I had a good day, I had a bad day, I had a good day, a bad day. That's not kingdom. Good day, bad day. There's no such criteria. The criteria is a God day. Don't the Australians, they have it down, right? God day. <laughs> I think they got it right. Wait a minute. Anyway. No emails on that from Australia, okay. I don't know. But if your attitude is gratitude and you're grateful, everything that comes out of your life in thought, word, or deed will be a love motive. pressing you on all sides, eliminating all other options, and it will determine your behavior. Can you see how that would work? Then do it. Feast on the will of God. Choose to. Absorb it. Birth that new attitude. Get rid of the creepies in you. Cleanse it out. Become a partaker of the divine nature. And now you've got God reality. God initiative, God provision. Okay, what do I do now? Well, now express it. How does it come out? Well, it comes out in God reality. God is real to me and full of life, joy, and love, and kingdom expression. I'm maintaining that connection too. If anything comes against me today, I just release forgiveness in advance. I'm even releasing forgiveness in advance when I don't need to. Call prevenient prayer. I'm praying ahead of the devil. Before anybody gets me out on the wrong side, I'm releasing a fountain of love because I am grateful for what God is doing in me, through me, and expanding the kingdom of God. Now, my motivation is love. I'm pressed on all sides, eliminating all other options. Therefore, my motive is not anger. My motive is love. And I've learned from the time I was a baby Christian that when I received the love of God, a corrective word would like hurt, and yet I would feel the comfort and the love of the Holy Spirit attached to it if you pay attention. I don't mind a corrective word when there's love coming from it. That love 
then will determine your behavior, which is, and I want you to say this back to me, we're going to close, a redemptive will. A redemptive will. A redemptive will. You feast it on the will of God, you will become a redemptive-oriented person. You'll become a kingdom person, and you're always looking, where's the redemption? That's just like when people used to get mad, and they used to say, well, I'm just speaking the truth in love to you, brother, sister. My first question is, a lot of times you can discern what's on it was not a lot of love. <laughs> so I'd say, where's the redemptive will? If you're just speaking the truth, are you sure you're not just speaking the truth because you're irritated and you would like it corrected so that your life would be easier? Or are you looking for kingdom advancement? For a redemptive will, or that mindset. Father, seal this word right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. We went extra long and extra repetitive on purpose <laughs> so that we could quiet that noisy flesh quiet that noisy flesh and steep ourselves in God reality, God initiative, and God provision. In Jesus' name, amen. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.